Now, the person of John, and again, I'm not wanting to focus so much on the person, per se, of whoever wrote the book, but just open it up, say, whoever wrote this book, I think it's John, Dr. Hunt thinks it's Lazarus or someone else, and things, but whoever wrote this book, whoever wrote it, there was a Palestinian influence here. Uh, there's a topographical awareness. Um, if I were to tell you about Baseline Road in Grand Island that I just mentioned, I grew up on Grand Island. That's my home. And therefore, I know things like Wallace Drive and Love Road and Grand Baseline Road and Ransom Road. Those are all roads that I traveled as a kid. And uh, so those, those, you just mentioned them naturally and things. And so it is in John here. If you're from Palestine, you're going to know these places because you walk these places. You know these places because you've walked there. And so what you've got is statements kind of like this a topical graphical awareness type of thing. And so it says in chapter 1, verse 28, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. This happened in Bethany on the other side of Jordan. Why would he say that? Because there are two Bethanies, at least two Bethanies. There's on the Mount of Olives, do you guys remember when you went on the Get Lost in Jerusalem program, we went up to the Pater Noster, the, the Our Father, where there's uh, all these languages with the, the this chapel with all these languages of Our Father and things. Just on the back side of the Mount of Olives, just on the back side of the Mount, just very close to that, is the town of Bethany. Bethany was on the back side of the Mount of Olives, and then you come up over Bethany, and then just up over the Mount of Olives, and boom, right down to the Temple Mount. You guys have seen from the top of the Mount of Olives, you get a beautiful view of the Temple Mount area there across the Kidron Valley. So it was, it was very close to Jerusalem. It was just over the, over the ridge, basically, out in, more in the desert and stuff, but the town of Bethany. And so there was a town right close to Jerusalem that was called Bethany. So whoever wrote this book is saying, whoa, I don't mean the Bethany. When I say Bethany, what are you going to think? It, it's the same thing that if I said to you Warsaw, if I said to you Warsaw, this is at Gordon College and when I'm outside of Boston, the North Shore of Boston, and if I said to, in the North Shore of Boston, I said Warsaw, Almost everybody in this room, when I say Warsaw, what would be the next word you'd think? You'd think Warsaw, Poland, okay? You'd think of Warsaw, Poland, okay? I mean, Warsaw is in Poland, the big city of Warsaw, capital of Poland or whatever. But actually, I'm not talking about Warsaw, Poland. I'm talking about Warsaw, Indiana, where I, I taught just in a place called Winona Lake, Indiana, in the Warsaw area uh, for 20 years and things. So Warsaw, Indiana. But if I'm going to say Warsaw, do I need to specify it's Warsaw, Indiana, so that you know that it's not Warsaw, Poland? So the guy here is aware that there are two Bethanies, and he's got to tell them, oh, no, it's the Bethany that was on the other side of the Jordan to the east, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles to the east. So um, topographical awareness, okay? Here's another example, and this is in John chapter 5, verse 2. Do you remember there was a lame man who was laying by a pool? And whenever the waters would stir, whoever got in the waters first got healed. Well, this guy had been there for like 38 years and hadn't been able to get in the water. He's crippled and things can't get in. It says in chapter 5, verse 2, Now there was, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. So first of all, do we know where the Sheep Gate is? Kind of ironically today, the Sheep Gate is called the Lion's Gate today. So if you go to the Get Lost in Jerusalem program, you go to Lion's Gate, that's actually Sheep Gate. That's where they brought the sheep in. The reason why they called it the Sheep Gate is that's where they brought the sheep in to go to the temple for sacrifices. So there was a she near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. By five covered colonnades. So you've got the pool of Bethesda with this water, and there's five covered colonnades that are there. Do you know that they've actually found this pool of Bethesda? They have actually found it in St. Anne's Church. If you go through Lions Gate and take a right, about 50 yards in, it's basically you're at the, the St. Anne's Church, and this is where the pool of Bethesda is. And do you know also that they have found those five covered colonnades? They've actually found that that area was did have those five col covered colonnades. So exactly what he describes here, they've actually archaeologically been able to find this stuff, and it's just an interesting confirmation. It's a little tidbit, you know, but all of a sudden you say, whoa, whoa, we found these exactly, there's five covered colonies here. The basis of the columns are still here and things. So that's at Bethesda, again, very detailed description, 
It'd be like me describing Wallace Tribe where I grew up. I could describe it in very much, very detail because that's it's home. That's where you grew up. The temple. In chapter 2, Jesus flips over the tables and stuff, and he says, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. And the people say then, wait a minute, wait a minute. Herod was 46 years building this temple. The num- knowing 46 years to build this temple, that's something that a Palestinian would know. Somebody that's, that's lived there would know. It's been re- being rebuilt for 46 years. It's kind of like if you're in Boston, and I said the big dig to you. And in Boston, the big dig went on for, actually, no. I don't know anybody that knows the big dig went on forever, okay? And it was like went from you know one billion dollars to ended up I think it was over fifteen billion dollars. Just kept multiplying, multiplying, kept going on and on and on. Just as all these people were trying to milk this project and they're called the big dig. There's a kind of a double put entendre there in terms of the big dig tax wise and other things for Boston area. But anyways, forty six years this temple was being built and uh, they knew that. And again, shows the Palestinian kind of framework and things. Now, um, the marks of an eyewitnesses. So whoever wrote this book was Jewish, describes the feasts and stuff. Whoever described this book is not only Jewish, but is also Palestinian. Very, very much aware of Jerusalem. Very, very much aware of topography and knowing, you know, there are two Bethanies, there's uh, where things are. Also, the fact that the book, whoever wrote the book was an eyewitness also. And so you've got this thing, a flat-out statement in John chapter 1, verse 14. We beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. We includes me. In other words, the guy is saying, I saw this. I saw this. Now, by the way, do we know that Luke did not see this? And Luke says, I talked to eyewitnesses. Luke didn't say, I'm an eyewitness. Luke says, I interviewed eyewitnesses. There's many other accounts. I took those things into account and wrote the book of Luke. This writer, whoever's writing here in John, is saying, we beheld his glory. I, was, I saw it. I'm an eyewitness kind of thing. Um, you've got these kinds of little details that tell you this guy really was an eyewitness. And so what happens? There's a guy named Malchus. Remember Peter? They're at the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, Jesus is going out praying once, and then he comes back. The disciples are asleep, and he goes out and prays again, goes back to sleep. Finally, just lets them go to sleep and stuff. And Jesus is out a third time. And then Judas comes up with the crowd and things. And Peter's got his sword. And Peter's playing macho. He whips out his sword and he lops off the guy's ear. Well, now other writers tell us, yeah, Peter lopped off the guy's ear. The writer of this gospel tells us that this guy's name was Malchus. We actually got the name of the guy whose ear was lopped off. And then Jesus puts the ear back on the guy's head and heals him, okay? And says, you know, Peter, put up your sword. You know, those who live by the sword, die by the sword. Don't do the sword. Sword's not right now. Here's, the, here's your ear back and puts it back on his head. Okay. The guy's name was Malchus. That's a sign of an eyewitness. In other words, he was there. He saw exactly who it was and knew the name of the person. That's absolutely incredible here. Uh, this Malchus, his name is listed. This is even more incredible is the fish. Now, you got to, I don't know whether any of you remember this. There used to be a movie called Rain Man back in, after the Civil War when I was growing up, Rain Man. And this guy had a, a problem with his brain, but then they dropped, a, they dropped like the, uh, I forget what it was, the um, toothpicks. They dropped a bunch of toothpicks out of a thing, and they looked down, and the guy could tell you exactly how many toothpicks were on the ground. Okay, Jesus is raised from the dead. Peter and this beloved disciple, are out in the boat. What happens? The guy on the shore says, hey, you caught anything? They said, nah, we've been out all night, we haven't caught anything. And things. He said, throw your nets on the other side. The guys throw their nets on the other side. All of a sudden, they get this huge catch of fish. Peter concludes, man, this must be Jesus, because Jesus has done this before. So Peter dives in and swims to the shore, while this other guy, being the more responsible one, hauls the, hauls the fish in. And it says then that the fish that were count here, this is in John chapter 21, this is after the resurrection, the guy says there's 153 fish there. Are we talking obsessive compulsive or what are we talking here? This guy, who would count exactly the number of fish? Okay, who would do that? I mean, most people like me, is we caught 100 fish, we caught hundreds, hundreds of fish, we caught a bunch of fish. You'd say something like that. This guy, does this show me, and this is one of the reasons why I would say that John wrote the book, is John a fisherman? John is a fisherman. And so the guy counts out 
knowing the number of exact fish that you caught is important to a fisherman. And so the fisherman counts out this stuff, and he says 153. That's a mark of an eyewitness. Nobody would remember that kind of detail. I mean, just you know, in the, in the stories of Jesus. This guy is an eyewitness and things, and so you get this 153 fish. This writer, whoever it is, gives us the exact hour. And a lot of times, as he's going through the narration of Jesus, he will tell us this was the, you know, this was the third hour, this was the sixth hour, this was the ninth hour. They start their day, by the way, at sunbreak when sun comes up. And so then, you know, third would be like nine o'clock, six hour would be noon, that kind of thing. So the exact hour is listed. Again, that's a mark of an eyewitness. Now, here's one that's interesting. These are explicit statements, and I want to read through some of these because I think they're really important. These are explicit statements where, the, where it confirms that this person was an eyewitness. Start in chapter 19, verse 35. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. Notice he's talking about himself in the third person. He doesn't say I, he's talking about this person. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. The purpose of the book of John is so that you may believe. None of his bones were broken. This man knows it because he was there and he saw that none of Christ's bones were broken on the cross. I know that. I was there. This man who's writing to you now knows that that is true because he saw that none of Christ's bones were broken. Chapter 19, verse 35. This is an interesting one too. Chapter 21, verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple, doesn't name himself, but this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies these things. This is the disciple. Who, so he's referring to himself in the third person. He doesn't put his own name in there. And he says, I'm the one Jesus said this to. And Peter was questioning. Peter says, what about this disciple and stuff? By the way, were Peter and John pretty tight? Peter, and John, Peter, James, and John. Who's at the transfiguration? Peter, James, and John. Those guys are tight. What happened to James, by the way? Peter, James, and John, this other son of Zebedee. James was killed early in the church. James passes off the scene early, early. He is martyred, one of the first martyrs, James. Okay, Stephen was earlier, but James was martyred very early. So Peter and John are tight. Okay, Peter and John are tight, and he says, what about this guy? And he says he was told that he would live forever, but he said, no, no, Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive. And, and that's very contra the book of Luke. Luke says, no, no, I'm not an eyewitness. I'm checking with eyewitnesses and things. And so that's uh, pretty significant there. <clears throat> 